creative society in general, and even to ourselves to be encouraged, to be motivated, and to be inspired. Life in general is challenging, and all of us go through ups and downs, some values being deeper than others. Add to this the uncertainty of life and livelihood that this ravaging pandemic has made reality. And it's, if anything, surprising if we don't all feel a little or even a lot discouraged sometimes. And that's okay. We're allowed to. Actually, it's supposed to feel whatever we feel. But what we should not do is limit ourselves to living in and by those feelings. So today, and once every month, starting from today, Amcham Sri Lanka will bring you a reason to smile, to learn, to grow, and to be inspired through celebrating the power of perseverance and belief. Here to share his incredible, inspiring journey with us is doctor, lawyer, and disability advocate, Dr. Dinesh Palipana OAM, Queensland Australian of the Year 2021, awarded the Medal of the Order of Australia for Service to Medicine in 2019, Junior Doctor of the Year at the Gold Coast University Hospital 2019. And all this coming back from a devastating injury to his spinal cord that left him paralyzed from neck down during his third year as a medical student. It's my absolute privilege to welcome you, Dinesh. And I want to start off by thanking you, not just for taking the time to share with us and chat with us, but also for who and what you are and what that means to everyone across the globe striving to overcome various challenges and achieve their dreams. Oh, thank you very, very much for having me. Uh, it's, uh, it's a real privilege. There you go. Sorry, Dinesh, I think my screen froze a little bit, so I'm not sure if That's I can. Okay. Okay. It froze for a minute, but I'm still here. <laughs> okay, excellent. So Dinesh, tell us a little bit about yourself. What were the circumstances that led uh, to you becoming a quadriplegic? Uh, well, uh, this happened in 2010. I was in medical school at the time. Uh, and I was halfway through medical school. I often used to visit my parents who lived about an hour and a half away from uh, where I was going to medical school. So I went to visit them one day and, um, you know, I think sometimes we have those uh, moments where it's almost like fate or destiny where you have those sliding doors moments and, uh, you end up happening to be in a particular place at a particular time. And I think this was one of those times. So I happened to leave the house um, and it was raining that day. And uh, I was driving along the highway and it was pretty dark and there were roadworks and I missed a couple of turnoffs. So I ended up in this particular stretch of highway at about 8.30 p.m. And I came up to this uh, black slick on the road. It was just a shiny black bit of water or oil or something, but it came up so quickly and it was too late to avoid it. But as soon as I drove over it, my car started to slide all over the road and it spun and spun and spun. And then it mounted an embankment and it came back down and my car started flipping through the air front to back and um, as it was flipping I think I knew that there was nothing more I could do so I tried to um, I tried to let go of the fear because it was, it was extremely scary you know and the car was flipping I could see the glass exploding around me and things were flying around the cabin and it was one of the most violent experiences that I've ever had in my life but uh, the car, it finally stopped, stopped flipping. And when it landed, the car was upright. And I tried to get out of the car and I realized that I couldn't move anymore. And then I tried to open the door and I realized that my fingers weren't working anymore. 
And then I put my hand on my leg and I realized that I couldn't feel my legs. So I knew what had happened and I knew the worst possible thing has happened. And uh, I can't even begin to tell you what that feels like. Just realizing that uh, life has changed forever within those seconds. And uh, that's how I got the spinal cord injury. I, I, I can't fathom, as you said, I, I, I mean, there's no way you can begin to explain it and there's no way someone like, you know, can understand uh, that reality. How, Dinesh, how do you, I mean, it, it, like you said, it's your entire life changed in that split couple of, you know, seconds. How did you come to terms with this reality? How did you deal with this new reality that was your life? I mean, you were on your way to so many things at this point. Yeah, I think um, what you realize as time goes by is that um, we can lay all these plans and we can have all these visions for the future. And um, how many of us are on this call and how many of us had a life that's gone exactly according to plan? I don't think many of us have had that life. So life is a very dynamic and unexpected thing most of the time. So what I've learned is that uh, you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, I work in the emergency department these days and um, our emergency department is the busiest emergency department in Australia. And it's one of the busiest in the world, I think, as well. Um, and we see all kinds of trauma, uh, we see heart attacks and strokes and all sorts of things. But um, sometimes, you know, I've seen people that have woken up one morning, they've had lunch with their family, they've spent time during that day with them, and then in the afternoon they've passed away from something. And you don't know, you know, I always wonder whether they woke up knowing that they were going to die that day. And I always wonder whether if they knew that was their last day on earth, whether they would have lived it differently. So I guess what I'm trying to say is life, life is uh, very unpredictable and life changes within seconds. And I think we've all learned that over the last year more than anything, right? We've got, we were going on about our lives and then a pandemic happened and now everything's changed. And I know Sri Lanka is going through a particularly difficult time now. So uh, life changes within seconds. And um, you have to, you either keep going or you give up. And you just have to keep going, right? Otherwise, you just, you just lay down and uh, die pretty much. So I had to make a choice to keep going. And it wasn't easy. It was uh, one of the most difficult things that I've had to do. And um, we've had some really, really hard times to get to where I am today. And, uh, but, you know, here we are and uh, life's good. So it's not easy. And life's always about ups and downs. One of my friends um, in Sri Lanka, actually, he likes to say that uh, life is all about ups and downs. So you're going to have highs and lows. And when you have those highs, you have to be in the moment and be present and enjoy them because you never know how long that's going to last. But when you have the lows, you have to know that there's a high around the corner because everything is impermanent. Nothing in this world lasts forever and everything's impermanent. So understanding that and knowing that can help you get through the low times and be better. I guess the other thing is, you know, I feel incredibly lucky to be living in, um, I feel incredibly lucky to have the life that I have because there are so many more people that are less fortunate than I am. There are 7 billion people on this planet or something around that. So there is always going to be someone worse off than us. And, um, I'd hate to be that 7 billionth guy who's having the worst day on this planet. But 
<laughs> there's only a one in seven billion chance that any one of us are like that. So there's always going to be someone worse off. So I guess thinking about those things and keeping things in perspective as hard as it was and being grateful um, for the things that I did have helped me get through it. Um, Dinesh, what would you say, um, so, so like it, from what you said, it, basically it was about coming to the understanding that uh, you need to focus on the positives. Uh, this is a journey in itself, right? Um, but having got to that point, I'm sure like the first couple of years would have been really, really frustrating as you learn to deal with the realities of your physical capabilities, um, what you could possibly do, relationships, all of these things kind of become a whole new learning experience, right? Um, what would you say, though, was that catalytic sort of moment for you? where you actually decided, no, I'm not going to let this define me. I'm going to redefine it. Because that's what you have done. You have taken what would have been um, such a negative situation and rather than let it define who you are and what you are and what you're capable of and what you give back to the world, you have defined it for yourself. What was that catalytical moment for you? Yeah, you know, it's a very interesting thing because physically it's certainly a very different life. So um, when I first woke up in the intensive care unit, uh, there's the paralysis, which is the spinal cord injury and you can't move, um, which, is, which is one thing. But you can't also feel, so I can't, I don't have any sensation, so I can't feel most of my body and because I can't feel things and my skin doesn't work properly I can't control the temperature either so my body temperature can fluctuate a lot um, if it's summer it can get really really hot and I need to cool it down externally and if it's winter which is what it is now we need to use heat externally to try and maintain a normal body temperature so there's that my lung function is extremely poor because I no longer have the muscles that support my lungs to breathe as normal. So today, actually, I did a lung function test and my lungs are functioning at about 30% capacity. So this period where COVID is happening, it was a particularly dangerous thing for people with spinal cord injuries and uh, medical conditions like mine because you can die a lot easier. And um, when I first woke up in the intensive care unit, I was on a ventilator. I couldn't speak after I came off the ventilator. I couldn't speak a full sentence like I'm talking to you now. And um, my heart, my blood pressure, all those things weren't working properly for a long time. So it took a lot of work to be able to speak a full sentence and to be able to even sit up for a long period of time and to be able to go out and about. It took a long time and a lot of effort. And um, I think, I don't think there was one particular moment that I chose um, that I'm not going to let this define you, but it was a series of uh, moments and, sit, and a long period of time. And, you know, um, I actually, I was in Sri Lanka immediately after the accident for, for a period of time. And I remember uh, I was staying at this place in um, Colombo 3. And it was a place that used to look over into the Indian Ocean. And I was, I was bed bound most of the time those days. But I remember watching the sunset over the Indian Ocean and just thinking about life. And there were these days and days and days where I was thinking and I was thinking and I was thinking and I thought that um, this is going to be a period where I'm going to reinvent myself and this is going to be a period where I'm going to come back a better person than I was before. And I promised myself that I would come out stronger and better and um a good person. So 
I use that time as well just to read a lot of books and uh, think about the kind of person that I want to be. Um, and so um, I wrote down all these things that are important to me, like um, integrity and honesty and truth and perseverance. And I thought that um, I'm going to use that opportunity to reinvent myself to be better than ever. So that, that's what I used that time to do, but it wasn't a moment. It was a, uh, it was a period of time that I chose to do that. And I think I was really lucky to have people in my life that helped me along that way. Like I had some close friends and my mom and um, all those things helped to push me into the right direction. Having taken that decision that you were going to go out and be better, do better, um, create a better you and thereby create a better world around you. Uh, you decided that you were going to continue pursuing your medicine and that you were going to become a doctor. What are the challenges you faced in accomplishing? I mean, getting to the decision is hard enough, but once you get there, that's still just the first step. How about actually getting out there and achieving what you wanted to do? What were the challenges that you faced in that and how did you deal with them? I think the, a lot, the biggest challenge in life for all of us is our self and the barriers that we have in our own heads. You know, how many of us uh, think about, you know, oh, I'll do it tomorrow or I'll do it next year or I'll do it um, when the new year comes or I'll do it when the kids grow up or I'll do it after I finish this thing or I'll do it when I have enough money um, or maybe I'm not smart enough or maybe I'm not strong enough or Maybe um, this is going to take too much time or whatever. So we have all these different barriers in our heads. And for me too, I had uh, barriers in my head because now suddenly I was thinking, will I be able to do this with uh, how my body is now? Will I be able to do things? Will I be able to get through? So I had all these things in my head. So that was one. And um, overcoming that I think is the biggest challenge, overcoming yourself. You are the biggest enemy we all face is ourselves. So that's the, that's the big thing to overcome. So once I overcame that, it was about, um, there are a lot of barriers for people with disabilities. Um, you know, I think, I think that's a funny word, actually. I think um, I don't really feel disabled. Uh, I have a different ability. So I think there are a lot, a lot of barriers still for people like that. And I remember having some conversations with different medical schools around the world. And the opinion was that someone with my physical capabilities couldn't be a doctor. Fortunately, I had enough people in my medical school to support me through getting uh, through and they accepted me back to medical school. And then once we did that, I just figured out ways to do things. So I figured out how to hold a stethoscope and how to examine a patient and how to get around the hospital and do all those things. So I taught myself how to do that. I taught myself how to even do some small procedures with a bit of help. So, um, you know, as I did more and more and more, I realized that all these things are in our head, all the, all the barriers and all the fears and all those things are in our head. And once you start to overcome those things, um, you know, it's, it's so liberating. So those were some of the barriers, but I mean, there, there were other things as well, like life. There was a period of time after the accident because we lost everything. We lost family, we lost friends. We went through a lot of hardship. Financially, it was incredibly difficult. And it was just me and my mom for a long period of time. And there were some days where we didn't have any money. We didn't know where we were going to live the next day, but we got through. Um, so I, I didn't, you know, I didn't live in a place like this for, for a long, long time. So um, there were all those barriers as well, but you just, 
you know, the thing is, I knew that if I didn't try and I knew that if I didn't give this um, a good shot, that I would regret it forever. And I think the biggest tragedy in life is getting to the end of it and having regrets because you can't turn back time. And one of my friends told me that uh, life is not a dress rehearsal. The show is happening now. So I just decided to jump in and give it my best shot. And uh, here we are. Oh, I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. Yes. Um, so as you were saying, I think it's like you said, it's mainly about the barriers in your head. It's about believing in yourself. It's about, uh, you know, stopping making excuses, which we all do. Uh, there's always a, okay, tomorrow, or like you said, I'm not good enough, or I can't afford it, or I can't, you know, there's always the can't and the won't. Um, and like you said, that's absolutely the first step. Um, what do, would you say uh, is your workaround, as it were, when you face um, sort of maybe a, um, a, a situation or a, um, or a response that is actually something that there is no way to get past. Uh, would you then say that the next step would be to, as you earlier said, use the word reinvent, uh, would you say that the next step would be to then reinvent your strategy in getting to where you want? Would that be how you would yeah. encourage somebody disillusioned right now? I don't, I don't, uh, you know, um, my mom, uh, I think I'm very lucky uh, to have a person in my life that's always made me feel like I can do anything and that anything is possible. When I was growing up, um, she, whatever I wanted to do, uh, whatever idea I had, she, she always said, yes, you can do that. And yes, that's possible. At the age of 14, I, she helped me register my first business. And, um, you know, that, that's, that's just been the kind of person she is. So, and she really, really moved our family along and always was looking forward. So I, I'm lucky to have an influence like that in my life. And because of that, I don't really believe that uh, you said that you were talking about barriers that you can't get through. And I don't believe that there are any barriers that we can't get through in life. So um, whatever is in front of you, there's a way around it. So I told you about a person that made me feel like anything's possible. But similarly, there are people in our lives that um, put up barriers and tell you that things aren't possible. I'm sure that um, some of us in this conversation have had parents or teachers or elders or brothers or sisters or friends or bosses who have told us that um, we're crazy for having some idea or we are not good enough to do something or that we're silly or, you know. I actually had a teacher once who said that I would uh, not amount to much and uh, last year, I sent him an email and he apologized about where I am in my life. But the point is, um, again, when we're going to get to the end of our life one day, those people are not going to be there. And it's just going to be you. So you can't look back and blame those people for where your life is at that point. You're only responsible for your decisions and where you are. So why should we give someone the power to dictate where our life ends up? And why should we give someone power to have regrets in our lives at that point? That's such a waste. So I think whatever barrier comes up, you find a way around it. You fight through it. You find a way around it. You, uh, you just persist and persist and persist. There's always a way. Always, always, always away. You just have to have the will uh, to do it. And we see it all the time, right? We see, we see human beings do amazing, amazing things. And it's not because, in, you know, we're not, we're built the same. We have largely similar DNA. We're not uh, fundamentally different physiologically. 
um, our anatomy is not significantly different. What's different is our will and our mindset. And, and that is the only thing that separates us. You know, I was, um, I was talking to a team of athletes just this morning and um, when, the, when these athletic teams or athletes, when they lose or struggle, it, it's rarely because they're physically different. It's rarely because of that. It's, it's most of the time because of their mindset. It's uh, because of how much they want to persist or how much they try. So um, you just have to have that mindset and the will to push through any barriers um, and, and just to keep going because at the end of the day, we need to be accountable for our lives and we need to be happy with it when we get to the end of it. I think, you know, my biggest fear is getting to one day and having regrets. I don't want to have any regrets. And you know what? It's never too late. Like some people say, you know, I'm, I'm too old or I'm too this or I'm too that. Um, the founder of Dilma, he was in his 50s when he started Dilma. And now it's, it's sold all over the world. Everyone's seen his face on TV around the world. Um, and uh, I think that's an amazing thing. So there's, uh, it's never too late. And uh, you can always, always reach the life that you want. Uh, you mentioned that your mom uh, helped you start your first business when you were 14 years old. Tell us a little bit about your childhood. When did you leave Sri Lanka? What was life for you when you were here? Uh, what about school? What about friends? What do you remember most about Sri Lanka? Um, we left Sri Lanka on my 10th birthday. So, um, you know, it was, a, it was a very special place because we had family. Um, but we moved around a lot because my dad was an engineer for the water board. So we moved around a lot. And I think in total, I've been to nearly 10 schools. And we lived all over the place. So we were very transient. Um, but I remember, you know, I just remember family. But I also remember it was a difficult time for Sri Lanka back then. It was still during the war. So I remember some of those things. Um, and... Uh, I went to so many different schools. So I went to St. Thomas College in Bandarulu for a little while. Um, and then I went to all these other schools. And uh, I don't think we stayed anywhere long enough for me to make lifelong friends at that time. And then we moved to Australia. And then, uh, again, I went to several schools because we moved around a lot. Um, but actually I was a very naughty kid uh, and my mom had a handful when I was growing up. So um, I, uh, I was not very focused on academics uh, early on and um, I was just, uh, I was very distractible and um, naughty. I was very naughty. But I guess I must have a conversation with your mom at some point to find out more about those secrets in that case. Yeah, exactly. Many secrets. Many, many. <laughs> um, Dinesh, see, when, when I spoke to you over email a couple of days ago, I told you that um, watching your story um, actually brought tears to my eyes. And it was not just about, uh, oh my God, look at what has happened. But it was more about pride and inspiration at, these, at the spirit of resilience and courage uh, that both you and your mom absolutely exude in all that you do. I saw in the video that I was watching that right now your mom is pursuing her education in uh, becoming a disability counselor and stuff like that. Um, I know this is certainly not exclusive to anywhere, uh, but I feel like this is something that the Sri Lankan people have in abundance, resilience. Uh, I mean, we've survived decades of civil war, ravages of the tsunami, 
uh, various natural disasters, disasters, flooding, drought, uh, the heartbreak of the Easter uh, bombings, you know, and so much more, even at national level, leave alone what people go through in their personal lives on, you know, on the day to day. To day. Yet the spirit of Sri Lankan people, the smile that is always from the heart um, and that resilience. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, it's probably appropriate that there's a lion on the flag. Um, but I, again, you know, I always think to my mom because she she's like a lion. She's very strong. She's protective. She's uh, she has perseverance and uh, love, and she's she's amazing. But I think um, I think a, a large part of there are so many different ingredients to resilience, and I think when you've gone through a lot of hardship, um, particularly as a nation, like you know, like I remember when I was a kid, we had. Um, curfews all the time and power cuts and water cuts and all sorts of stuff. So, um, and then when you're, when you're facing a lockdown, um, we had some lockdowns here as well. And I just thought back to my childhood, I'm like, oh, we used to have these fairly often when I was growing up. So, but I think just um, going through those hardships makes, makes, a person stronger makes people stronger. Um, but I think it's also other simple things like gratitude. You know, gratitude is a big one. Just being thankful for the little things that you have um, and being grateful for the people around you. For me, it's something that uh, I, I do every single day. When I wake up, I think about a couple of things that I'm grateful for. That's how I start the day because we have, um, we we have so much to be to be thankful for, right? Like tonight, we're sharing this time with um, everyone that's on this call, and um, that's pretty special. I think we we have that to be grateful for. Um, if we have eaten a meal today, then we're luckier than so many people. That's something to be grateful for. We have a roof over our heads. That's something to be pretty grateful for. So I think gratitude is a big part of resilience. And I think in um, I think in Sri Lanka, a lot of people go through hardship to get to where they are in life at some point. Um, a lot of people. I remember some. Uh, we spent some time in Chilau when I was growing up, and some of the kids, like I was the only kid that had shoes in that school. And um, some of the kids lived in houses and they were studying by candlelight at night just to get through school and just to get to university and just to get somewhere in life. So I think people go through those hardships and people become strong through that. Um, and I think that all, all those things go towards building some resilience. Oh, you're on mute again. <laughs> No idea how this keeps happening. <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. Uh, I was saying, I think you're completely right. I mean, it is that gratitude at what you have, maybe that builds a resilience to not being overly affected by what you don't have or what you can't get. Um, but, you know, you, you're so right in so many ways. I mean, I, I too wake up each morning and I just look out my window, which you know, I have a garden full of, I'm in the center of Colombo and yet I have a garden full of beautiful big trees and there's always the squirrels making their racket and the birds and little, you know, the butterflies and all of it. And I look out there and, I, and every morning I think to myself, you know, oh my God, I'm just so blessed to wake up in the middle of this paradise when there's so much going on. I mean, you know, it could be weather extremities, it could be a war zone where people wake up, you know, not knowing uh, what, what are they going to survive the day and we're so blessed like this so yeah absolutely I think even if it's the small things we need to wake up and be grateful um, every day I guess every day if we can think of those three things in the morning and three things in the evening like you do um, that, I, that it also builds a better attitude towards life I guess um, Manish I was going to ask you about your mom 
Uh, you mentioned a little bit about her, but um, I, I too have a mom like yours, um, a lion, like you said, you know, who, whose um, hearts are so big and they've just, you know, been uh, these ferocious protectors and guardians and at the same time have taught us to be who we are. Uh, my mom too was a single mom. Um, so I identify with a lot of your story as well. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about her? She's become a hero of mine over the last couple of days that I've just, you know, kind of researched her. Um, and I'm, I, I really want to get her on the end of, um, you know, on, on, online at some point to have a conversation with her, which I will do. Um, but tell me a bit more about her, um, what, how much she has affected your life as well as what she's doing now and what the next step is for her as well. So she's, uh, yeah, my mom is, um, I think she's, she's always been really strong and um, she, she's taught me everything. So she taught me how to drive. She taught me how to shave. She taught me how to open a bank account, handle money. She taught me how to, uh, do all these different things. So she's taught me so much. Um, and she's always been, she, she's always restless for progress. She wants the, she wants the next step and she, she wants to go forward and she wants to advance. Um, so she's, she's always been like that. And she, uh, She's so giving to the people around her and she's so patient. But uh, she graduated from a master's degree this year. And it's funny, you know, um, in 2016, I graduated from medical school. And I was going across the stage as a medical graduate. And then she graduated this year with her master's. And she went across the exact same stage, but I was on the stage as staff to accept it. So it was just a full circle, really lovely moment. But these days she spends her time helping other people with spinal cord injuries and disabilities. And she makes a huge impact on them because she's a fighter for other people because she knows what we've gone through as a, our little family and um, she wants to help other people and other mums as well to get through what they're doing. So she's, she's done so much and she's helped so many people. And uh, you're right, she's definitely a hero. Thank you. Thank you for sharing those words with us. And uh, Chitrani, I'm sure you're listening somewhere. Um, I'll be getting to you pretty soon. <laughs> she's around. Um, she's I'm sure. Okay. Um, so, well, thank you, uh, Dinesh. My last question for you. Uh, what is your mantra? What is the creed that you live by? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. You know, I think, um, I think there are a bunch of things, right? I think um, gratitude is a big one. I think we all have to be grateful. We all have things to be grateful for. Um, and even if it's just little things, um, there, there is much, much to be grateful about. And I think we, um, we can also view things in a certain way. I read this book a little while ago. Oh, here she is. Come on. Hello. It's so good to see you. Lovely to see you too. Um, How's your day been? How's your evening? Yeah, really good. Really good. I was listening to him. Yeah. <laughs> we look forward to having you on the platform very soon as well. Oh, thank you. We'd love to. Thanks. Um, Have a great evening. <laughs> yeah, I read, this, uh, I read this book called The Diamond Cutter a little while ago. And it was about this Buddhist monk from Tibet. And he wanted to understand the world a bit better. And he thought that one of the best ways to understand the world and life is to go to New York and learn about business because business tells you a lot about human nature. 
and about how people do work and whatever else. And this book had some really good uh, points that I often think about. And I guess there are two things. Um, one is that when you, so he became a diamond trader and he reflects on how diamond trading is and about the Buddhist philosophies that are affected with it. So he talked about, you know, when you get a diamond out of the ground, it's shapeless and it's dirty and it's often fairly ugly. But you can take that diamond and you can cut it and you can cut it just right so the light just shines through it perfectly. You can see the rainbow and it sparkles. So our experiences in the world is like a diamond. So when you get an experience, it's a raw diamond and you can choose to keep it ugly and shapeless or you can cut it and see it in a way where it becomes shiny. So our experiences are like that. We can choose to think about it positively and we can choose to think about it um, in a beautiful way or we can choose to think about it in an ugly way. We have the choice to shape that. And I think that's a powerful concept. The second thing that he talks about, and I think um, it's something that's really important to me and mom, is giving. We live in a world and a society at the moment where you have social media and you have uh, uh, consumerism. We're at a point where we're always thinking about what we can get. How many more likes can we get? How many more possessions can we get? Can I buy a bigger car? Can I buy a bigger house? Can I buy nicer clothes? Whatever. And we're always looking inwards, right? But we're human beings and our souls are actually infinite. So if we try to look inwards and we're trying to feel that, it's a never-ending journey and we're never satisfied. But true happiness lies in looking outwards and giving to the world. So it's about uh, seeing whether we can leave this world a better place than we found it. It's about seeing that we can look after the people around us and love them and love our communities and give back to them. And it's particularly important during hard times. You know, when um, this, this particular book, he also talks about when businesses go through hard times, what's the first thing they do? They cut their staff, they cut their salaries, they stop their philanthropic activity and they stop giving. And then it becomes a spiral and the businesses end up collapsing anyway. But it's way more valuable to them look after your staff and to look after people and those businesses end up prospering. So the lesson is even in the toughest times, you have to keep giving. And uh, it's counterintuitive, but you just have to keep looking outwards. And that's happiness. And I guess the last thing, or um, two last things, if I may, is that uh, um, when, when we are, um, when our mind is free, um, because I went through a period where I was depressed before the accident and I had depression and I recovered from that. But now I have a spinal cord injury and my body's different. But having those two situations to contrast, I know that the depression was a far more paralyzing thing than the spinal cord injury was. Because when your mind is closed and when you're a prisoner in your mind, you're far more limited in what you can do than what your body is. So if you have a free mind, then you can be anything. And Stephen Hawking is a great example because his entire body was paralyzed, but his mind was so powerful that he changed the way we see the universe. And that's a, that's a pretty, pretty amazing thing. And the last thing um, is that we also live in a society that doesn't value excellence as much. And if you have a passion for something, 
I think pursuing that and pursuing excellence in it every day, where you're trying to incrementally become better at something, there's a great deal of satisfaction to be found in that. Um, so again, uh, this morning when we were talking to the athletes, we talked about becoming 1% better every day or half a percent better every day at any given thing. So if you try and become 1% better at something every day, in 100 days, you're going to be 100% better at that thing. So I think pursuing excellence also gives us fulfillment. And for me, that's been a big thing as well because I've really tried to be as good as I can be at what I do. So those are probably my five mantras. That's absolutely brilliant. Actually, now my, my brain is working 19 to the dozen. I'm trying to figure out how to get all this onto a piece of paper and share it out there so that people can actually, you know, you're the one who needs to write a book. We'll, we'll, we'll wait for that to come out. Um, I, actually but thank you. Writing, I actually finished writing a book last week. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, we shall look forward to sharing that as well. Um, thank you. But I mean, you, you've been just so inspiring. There's been nothing negative that you've had to say about anything. You know, it's all, um, yeah, you know, like I said, um, you know, I am inspired by you and I know that all our participants, uh, both here participating on Zoom as well as watching on YouTube uh, and on Facebook, are extremely inspired and are going to continue to be. Uh, we will highlight a couple of the things you said and share them uh, more widely so that people can, you know, actually start looking at these things, the ideas, taking from them, learning from them, because at the end of the day, like you said about giving, uh, the fact that you're giving so much back in teaching people to grow and to be strong and, to, and encouraging and motivating um, in itself is so amazing. And uh, we all must take from those lessons, absolutely. Thank you very much, Dinesh, for taking the time. I know it's late in the evening for you. You must be exhausted after a long day. Oh, no, it's um, my pleasure. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, that brings us to the end of the first of our series. Um, thank you, Dinesh, again, um, and to all of our viewers as well. Uh, the MCHAM Sri Lanka Be Inspired series is supported by LMD and the Daily FT. And as always, a reminder to subscribe, click the alert button, and of course, share the YouTube video, which is what keeps assisting us to continue bringing MCHAM's diverse and impactful online resources to you free of charge. As we conclude, a reminder from Dinesh, uh, his mom, Chitrani, the MCHAM team, and myself. Let's keep our physical distance, our masks on, hand sanitized, immunity boosted, fingers crossed, of course, and spirits up. Stay safe, I go on. And